to show you the Navio, which is a robotic assisted knee surgery uh, for knee replacements. So basically, this takes the guesswork out of doing a knee replacement and it makes your accuracy, increase your accuracy from a three degree uh, human error to a 0.1 degree human, human, human uh, error, error rate. So it's a very, very accurate way of, of doing knee replacements. Um, essentially how it works, we'll show you the robot just now. It uh, starts off, can we use the fur over here, fur with a little hand piece. Okay, the, the, the burr sits into this, this hole here. Um, and the little burr sh shoots in and out to make cuts and it's a handheld robotic device uh, using uh, sensors that connect to a sensor out, uh, close to the knee and as we as we move this burr across the surface of the of the, the tela, uh, of the femur and the tibia the burr shoots in and out and makes accurate cuts of, of, of the bone. is based on 3G spatial referencing. There's a stereoscopic camera which looks at the patient and the limb that we're operating on. And there's multiple arrays that we use. So the array is something that we attach to the bone and on this, this piece here are three circular discs which the stereoscopic cameras then pick up in space. So we have one array fixed to the tibia, one to the femur, and one to the hand piece. And that way the robot can tell where the femur and tibia are in, are in relation to each other, and where the hand piece is in relation to those two bones. And um, that's how it gauges. At all times, the array must be visible to the, the stereoscopic camera, and uh, the position must stay unchanged in relation to the bone. Um, we then gauge a few reference points, like the center of rotation of the hip joint, which is the ball and socket, the center of the ankle joint, the center of the knee, and once we feed that information to the computer, it then asks us to map out the joint surface, and then it goes on to cut for us. If the arrays are disappearing, it affects the knee, then you go to reposition them to be clean and visible. And, um, the screen has a sterile cover and the surgeon can interact with the screen during, during the operation um, even though it's, it's, it's completely sterile and um, it just lets you select steps so first you do the bony cuts in the implant position and then the final check for the range of motion So we use jigs like this, jigs that we you we screw that into the femur and we, we cut through the, the saw. But now we don't need to use it for this. We can just use this to just basically color the knee in like that. And it cuts for us instead of using these. These are called jigs that make, you know, we put that onto the femur and we by hand measure the angle, etc. And, and make the cuts, saw bone cuts. So it just takes that guesswork out of human error, you know. In the knee replacement, there's a plastic layer called a poly. That poly is designed to be loaded only in a certain direction. So it takes only axial load forces. If there's a shearing force, it fails earlier. So instead of failing at 15 years, it will fail at maybe five years. So we need to position it as orthogonal as possible to load it in that direction, prevent shear forcing. If it's still tilted, there'll be a slight shear force and it'll weigh earlier. In terms of accuracy, I think um, I mean, that's obviously important. Um, if there's uh, a little bit of a deviation from the accuracy, what are some of the uh, problems that you could experience? Yeah, so as Dr. Singh is mentioning, if, if, you, if your arrays get covered with blood or this gets moved, um, you can potentially have errors with that, but the computer has got inbuilt safety mechanisms to recheck and to go back on steps to, 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 to cover your basis. So.
Yeah, it does recalibrate. Um, we do it every time uh, we switch it on, like now it's, really, it's calibrating at the moment and it has a whole system of procedures that it goes through to, to say that everything is as it's supposed to be. There's also a pre-op before we um, go into the sterile field where we check all these devices as well, all these jigs, all these instrumentation to make sure that it is also calibrated and it's going to give us the accurate reading. So that's done pre-op or um, no, not exactly pre op, but while the patient is still being not to sleep and in between, so that we understand at that stage how whether we're going to continue with this or whether we're going to abandon the robotics part and go the traditional way of doing it. Does this machine have to be synced into be uh, calibrated by the company or so, yeah, yes. like once a year or maybe? So, yes, additional. it does get calibrated, but somebody comes to the machine, it doesn't get sent off the premises. So uh, then it, they will re then calibrate it in terms of certain standards and measurements that they've got. Yes. yes. The Smith & Nephew Navio Surgical System. The freedom of robotics in your hands for the Journey 2 XR Bicruciate Retaining Knee System. The Navio unit has a small footprint, ideal for any OR and portable for OR efficiency. First, Anatomic landmarks are captured, including a 3D model of the patient's cartilage and bone through direct surface mapping for both the femur and tibia. Next, soft tissue kinematics are evaluated for implant positioning and soft tissue balancing. Furthermore, the surface mapping and soft tissue evaluation provides the surgeon patient-specific planning to virtually place implant components and predict post-operative joint laxity through the full range of motion. Once the planning stage is complete, Navio handheld robotics is used to accurately remove distal femur bone per the Navio plan. Next, set rotation and placement for the AP cut guide by robotically preparing the pinholes. For the tibia, utilize the Navio handpiece to prepare the bone for the Journey 2 XR base plate. During trialing, Navio allows surgeons to confirm postoperative joint laxity compared to the intraoperative surgeon plan, with the flexibility to perform and evaluate ligament releases. So, knee replacement is all about soft tissue balancing. Uh, and if you put your knee in incorrectly, your soft tissues are unbalanced and then patients do poorly. So traditionally, the accuracy with soft tissue with knee replacement is about 85% of people are happy. Uh, and that 15 to 20% of people that aren't happy is because their knee is unbalanced. So this allows us to put in an implant that is as close to possible the native knee and allowing all the soft tissue to be balanced. And it increases your patient satisfaction from 85 or 80 to 85 percent to 95 percent. So that's ultimately the goal of this robot is firstly accurate cuts, but secondly to give patients a better a better functioning knee and to get the longevity of that knee, you know, make it last longer. So it's very important to get very accurate uh, cuts and things. ensure that our camera is well positioned so that the sensor arrays are detected by the camera as the knee is brought through a full range of motion. Okay, so that's just a verification. If the system fails, then we can go, we can always revert to, to the manual jigs, so it's not uh, that we are completely reliant on that. A group of passionate South African academic students and persons with disabilities are in the international spotlight today. They are uh, participating in the Cybathlon 2020 Championship. It's a robotics prosthesis Olympics. Those with physical disabilities compete to complete everyday tasks using technical assistance systems. Our reporter Nabila Sheikh has more. Using this prosthetic touch hand, the team from the KwaZulu-Natal and Nelson Mandela Universities are participating in the Cybathlon virtually. The touch hand was designed in 2013 by UKZN's Professor Rian Stopforth and has been modified through the years. 
Um, in living, in, unfortunately, in a world where there's a lot of war and there's a lot of um, people that are in, in serious accidents and losing limbs, and so therefore we are able to then assist them and we are able to um, make a difference in their lives. Will the touch hand someday be affordable to those who need it most? At the moment, we're probably sitting in about, um, I would guess, about 20,000 rand to be able to manufacture this device as it is, which is quite high in our opinion still, but it is still much lower compared to other devices um, on the market. Lungile Dick is one of the disabled participants representing the SA team with the touch hand. He lost his hand during an accident in the workplace in 2006. Uh, it may not be as high-tech as other people want it, but to a person with disability, um, it means a lot. It means a lot that I can pick up something. It means a lot that I can, you know, pick up a ball, right? It adds value. The bigger picture for the team is a dream to provide low-cost prosthetics to disabled South Africans. Nabila Sheikh, Durban. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the Sabathon event was hosted globally and we hosted in the lab at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. It was a collaboration with the Nelson Mandela University and we had a team that was able to visit and participate in the event. To participate in the Sabathon event is for us already an achievement. Um, just being able to be selected and to say, well, we are not only representing South Africa, but as well as Africa. It allows us to know that what we've done over the years has um, had a positive impact and that um, we have actually made a difference already. The electronics were programmed and this moved the actuators, which in turn moved the 3D printed mechanical parts. Challenges in terms of load shedding, um, where the power goes off for a certain time period during the day, um, and we might be in the middle of a test, we might be in the middle of 3D printing um, parts, and then suddenly we've got to stop, wait for the load shedding to go past, and then only we have, um, it's not a sort of thing of just continuing with where we were, we've got to start from scratch again. The biological signals were received from the pilot or the amputee's arm. This was decoded and it allowed for the movement of different um, gestures on of the hand. A lot of calibration was needed to make sure that the signals were decoded properly. It was quite pedantic about the way that they set out things and everything needs to be 100% and that is the way that they wanted it to be. So we were making sure that the tables had to be a certain size, we had to make sure that the um, different um, tracks and um, things are measured out correctly and so that allowed us to uh, meet the requirements and rules that they've um, set out um, for the event to be. We are hoping to enjoy the event, have fun and um, just be able to as a team be able to enjoy and see all the work and effort that we've put into it and what we've, we are able to achieve with that. Cool. Yeah. Right, so this is the last race that the touch and team participated in the sabathlon. This is a breakfast stage. So this is typical tasks that a person would be doing at the at um you know if they have breakfast. So the challenging part over here was probably the opening of the tin. Um, it was sort of difficult um, in this specific um, stage that we had the one tin opener did not function or work properly and that's the one that was practiced with the pilot so the opposite hand one was used um, it's a competition you have to brainstorm to find a solution and so this was no other tin opener that we could use so we had to make do with with, with the other one and so the different tasks are, are done. You'll see that there's blue items, for example, and this has to be touched with the prosthetic hand. Um, yet the other items can be touched without the prosthetic and can be touched with the um, usable hand as well. So in this case, the tin opener was not blue, and so both hands were able to be used. 
And it didn't really matter how you went to go and do the different tasks, as long as the tasks were performed. So opening up a bottle, for example, could have been done by just pushing a bottle underneath the arm. Opening up of um, sugar cubes that are wrapped in, in paper wrapping. And with this type of thing, you were able to use quite initiative ways of, of doing it. So with the breakfast table, there was an advantage. That there wasn't really blue items that restricted to you in terms of what you could do. And so you, we were able to perform quite well. Now, for example, lighting off a candle. The bread over here was demonstrated with a foam block, which was the bread, and this was had to also be cut. So not all the tasks had to be completed. And the thing with the Sabathon event is that each stage, or what they refer to as tasks, had subtasks. And if you failed any one of those subtasks, the whole stage is failed. So this was a bit of a disadvantage because you could have spent some time in that specific stage, perform all of the different tasks, except for one, and then you failed that whole um, stage which means that you didn't actually get the points um, allocated to those different tasks. There's a lot of things that are difficult to do that we take for granted. For example, just picking up this pin and having to insert it into a hole. I mean, it's very easy for us to do that, but when you're using a prosthetic device, it becomes more difficult. And it becomes very much a balancing act that you've got to... Um, take into account. With a cup here to make sure that the pilot to make sure that the balls wouldn't fall out. And essentially in this stage it was well, yeah it was essentially they having to move items from the one table to the other table. The USB drive is, is always a challenging one. It's a very th small item and you have to also be able to position it in such a way so it gets inserted into the USB drive the correct way. It's always an issue even for us as able-bodied people to insert the USB drive the correct orientation into the computer. Okay, USB drive foul, and therefore there was no need to continue with that stage. In South Africa, Lungele Dick has already got 14 points on the board for successfully completing the breakfast challenge. Uh, we pick him up at the haptic box. This is a great story. Uh, low cost is really what it's all about for this South African touch hand uh, team uh, making a prosthesis that is available for those that don't have huge resources but still need the possibility of working with such a valuable tool and look at this the south african doing extremely well yes, in the haptic right, box right right exactly nick you uh, it doesn't have to be expensive i mean um if it's out of the 3d printer or whatever i mean it should be that's really crucial um, to, to give hands to everybody, actually, who needed hands as well, with uh, actually for children as well, children with disabilities. Well, as Michelle has called this, the, uh, the challenge of magic boxes, <laughs> just touch and then try and match all of the pieces on the table to what you feel inside the box, but you cannot see. I think this is a fantastic new addition to Cyblathon and also pushing the boundaries of development within these prostheses for the arm. And has the South African got them all correct? This is a valuable point score. It's Whoa, the highest point score of all the six tests, 16. He did a great job. Very nice. And it's so tricky. This one, I would say this one is one of the tri trickiest tasks of the whole parkour. Because it, is, it has nothing to do with quickness. It has to do with, you know, you have to be very gentle kind of thing. And to, not to guess, to feel the option. 
It's another change. Oh, <laughs> that's enough. He's ready. Here we go. There's one. There's two. Wow. Three. Perfect. Oh, Jackpot. Yes. Perfect Jackpot. score. <laughs> Great to see from the South African. Now the pyramid with the... Let's see. Now, uh, Lungeli Dick for South Africa now has to just complete his uh, stacking of the cups to a vertical pyramid and his challenge is over. This has been a good performance for the South African touch hand team. What's interesting about the haptic feedback um, stage is that the touch hand team was the only team all across the world was able to complete that stage successfully in all three rounds that they had to um, perform. So with this cup stacking um, type of task, it is quite difficult. Uh, decoding the signals from the biological muscles is not always as easy as what it might appear, especially in like, YouTube videos of what people are doing and stuff. It's not just an over weekend type of task. And there's different ways you can go and pursue it. It can be done with through machine learning. You can be using maybe different thresholds in terms of the signals that are received. And so it, having to, to sort of control their hand and do these different tasks are not always as easy as what it appears. And Gilly did an excellent job, always making sure that he's completing the, um, the stage as, as well as the race, even if the end buzzer went off. With the limited resources that we had, we achieved what was basically impossible. Um, with so many challenges that we had to face and things. And being as the first time we actually participated in the event, um, we at least didn't come last and we did perform quite well.